Good morning. So nice to be with you again. Uh, I know the majority of you uh, because I used to be a member here a long time ago. Uh, but some of you I haven't met yet, Lord willing. Uh, I'll get to meet you today. But, uh, but it's, it's really good to be with all of you. The church here is very important to us. And uh, y'all probably think I cry every time I get up to preach. It's really only here. <laughs> but anyway, it's good to be with you. But we're talking today about the the scriptures. Now, I I stole one of your Bibles from the back because I know Adam likes the CSB, so I put all the quotations in the CSB. I might read it off of there rather than from here, but we'll we'll see how that goes. But uh, I want to talk today. I'm not good with titles. My titles are are not not very good. They're not interesting, but but the point of the sermon is... (laughs) I want to talk about people that don't serve publicly, whether that's the women who are prohibited from speaking in the church by Christ, or whether it's men that are unable to to get up and give talks or lead singing or prayers or whatever it may be. There are those that they feel like they're not worth as much in the kingdom as those that can stand up here and deliver a lesson, or who can teach a class, or lead singing, or something like that. And I, I want us to look at what the scriptures actually tell us about this idea, because it's important for all of us to understand that it's one body that works together. So, first thing I, I want to talk about is when we talk about doing things publicly, a lot of times what we're talking about is the teaching or preaching. There's actually a lot that women and others that may not be, may not feel like they can get up and give a talk to the congregation. There's a lot of teaching that they can do outside of the assembly, isn't there? There's lots and lots of work to be done. And the the Lord expects us all to be working on that. And some of that work, if we talk about the work of women, Some of that teaching can only be done properly by women. Uh, That's what we uh, we read about in Titus chapter 2. In verses 3 through 5, he says, In the same way, older women are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not slaves to excessive drinking. They are to teach what is good so that They may encourage the young women to love their husbands and to love their children, to be self-controlled, pure, workers at home, kind, and in submission to their husbands, so that God's word will not be slandered. Now, the first thing I want us to see here is that he says the older women are supposed to be teaching the younger women. That is God's plan for who is to teach the younger women. That doesn't mean that preachers and and teachers who are men don't teach women, but there are certain things the older women are told to teach the younger women that I can't teach. I can teach you, if you're a younger woman, I can teach you that you're supposed to love your husband. But what what does that mean coming from a man? (laughs) And how do you love your husband? Well, I don't know how you're supposed to love your husband. The older women do. They've been through it. They've had hard times with their husbands, right? You've you've had times when you've had to love your husband when he's been very unlovable. I I can get up here and I can tell you some of that stuff, but it doesn't mean much. But when an older woman who's been through it teaches you, it ought to mean something. And that's God's plan. He wants that to be done. This is something that the men, like me, cannot do nearly as well as the older women can do. To love their children. Now, I love my children. I'm sure all the fathers here love their children. But do we love our children the same way that their mothers love them? 
I think mothers are a little bit different, and that's designed by God to be that way. And what, what the older women are teaching the younger women of how to love your children, how to train them properly, how to, to guide them, that's something, yeah, we, even the men sometimes learn something from what we hear from the, the older women. <laughs> but, but we need, we need to, to, to understand that the older women are better designed for this work. And God gives this work to them. This is important work. How important is it? When we get down to the end, what does he say? So that God's word will not be slandered. That's pretty important, isn't it? The work that the older women have to do, to teach them to be self-controlled and pure. Now, can I tell the young women to be pure? Sure, I can tell them to be pure. Can I tell them how to be pure when a young man is trying to get them to be impure? Not really. I don't, I don't have that wisdom. But the older women do. Okay? We, we have that, that need for the older women to be busy with this work, to be teaching the younger women. If you leave it to the preachers, there's going to be a huge lack of teaching that needs to be done. We need everybody doing their, their work. The workers at home. Now, I know some men work at home, but can we really teach the, the, the young women how to be workers at home the way God designed, the way that the older women who have been workers at home can teach them? I, I don't think that we can do as good of a job. And to be kind, do I need to, do I need to point out that women are better at being kind than men? <laughs> I think that's just natural, isn't it? God made women that way, but you still have to be taught how to be kind. And so the older women, they've experienced kindness in their life, and they've been able to show kindness. They can teach this. We need this. We need the older women doing this work. And we don't need people saying, I'm not, I'm not an older woman. <laughs> either just because you're afraid of, of being old. Uh, just if, if you have the experience, you can teach the younger women. Right? Uh, and to be in submission to their husbands. Can I teach that you should be in submission to your husband? Yeah. Can I teach you how to submit to your husband? Maybe a little bit. But if a woman's having trouble being submissive to her husband and another man comes and tells her, does that really make a difference. Not that much usually. But when the older woman says, look, I've had the same kind of problem with my husband, but here's how I was submissive to him anyway, that can make a huge difference. We need everybody doing their part. There's so much teaching that can be done outside of just public teaching, sitting down and talking with people. Of course, this is talking about among Christians, but of course, there's lots of teaching to be done with our neighbors, with people we work with, with everybody. We can sit down, we can just talk with them. There's a lot of work that we can do that everybody who's able to, to talk about God with their friends can do. And it's important work. There's a lot of other work in the church that is to be done, or among, among God's people, that's to be done besides the public speaking. This is one of the, the important roles in the church, delivering the messages of God. But why? It's the same as elders, right? Elders, evangelists, teachers. What's the purpose? To build up the body to do what? To do their work. That's what Ephesians 4 tells us. This, what, what we do isn't what's so important. What we're doing is trying to get you, everybody, all of us, in fact, including us, <laughs> to do the work that God has designed us to do. What the preacher does is just try to help us see what that work is and how we're supposed to think. And then we're supposed to be going out and doing it. 
in, in Romans 16, this is one of the passages we often skip over, but there's so much in Romans 16, in these greetings that Paul gives, that, that just jumps out at you when you read through it sometimes. At the beginning, in Romans 16, he says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church in Sincrea. So you should welcome her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever matter she may require your help. For indeed she has been a benefactor of many and of me also. Now, here's a sister in Christ. He says she's a servant of the church in Sincrea. He doesn't say specifically what she did there. We know she wasn't a preacher. But he speaks of her just the same as he would a preacher, doesn't he? Because whatever role she was doing to benefit the church was just as important. She is a servant of the church. And what does he say about her when she's receive her in a manner worthy of the saints? Well, that's pretty much what he says about Timothy when he sends him to, to Corinth, right? A preacher. But now he's saying this about a sister in Christ, just as important. She, and a sister in whatever matter she may require your help. If she needs financial support, you give her financial support, just like a preacher. Why? Because she's a servant of the church. Because she's working for the Lord and the, the workers worthy of their wages. The preacher is not some special person that's worthy more of others of respect or support. It's just, it's an important work, but there's so much other important work. And we have sisters in Christ and brothers in Christ who are doing other work that's just as important. And we need to recognize that. We need to see, Paul saw this, this apostle evangelist preaching everywhere all over the place. He says, this sister is a servant who is worthy of your, your welcoming her and assisting her in whatever she's doing because she's a servant of the church. If we keep reading, he says, Give my greetings to Prisca and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life. Not only do I thank them, but so do all the Gentile churches. Greet also the church that meets in their home. And I'll stop there for a minute. Now, we, we know Prisca or Priscilla and Aquila, that those were people that Paul worked with in tent making for a while in Corinth. And uh, then they, they moved on to Ephesus and met Apollos and straightened him out on some things. And, and then eventually they wound up in Rome again. That's where they were from. But now... Paul doesn't say, you know, greet, greet Aquila. He, he includes both of them, doesn't he? <laughs> and he even puts her first, Prisca and Aquila. Yeah, she's just as important as her husband in this work of the Lord. They're not doing the same things, but what she does is just as important. Uh, they, he says, they are my co-workers in Christ Jesus. Both of them. And he, he says they risked their own uh, necks for my life. We don't know what happened there. We're not, that's not recorded. But those brethren knew what happened. And he says all the churches of the Gentiles give uh, thanks to them. That's pretty important, isn't it? Whatever she did along with her husband, that was, that was pretty important in the work of the Lord. Uh, and they have a, a church meeting in their home. Now, I might be reading too much into it, but who usually has to take care of the, the home <laughs> more than the other? Well, the, the wife does. They have a church meeting in their home. The burden's more on her usually than on the husband, and yet she's, she's doing that wonderful work. Well, they, they both are. And then he says, greet my dear friend Epinatus, uh, who is the first convert to Christ from Asia. Greet Mary, who has worked very hard for you. 
We don't know who Mary is, but it's clearly a woman. And he says she has worked very hard for you. We don't know what she did, but there was work outside of the public speaking that she was doing, and he says that's worthy of recognition. Uh, meet, greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews and fellow prisoners. They are noteworthy in the eyes of the apostles, and they were also in Christ before me. Greet Amphilius, my dear friend in the Lord. Uh, greet Urbana Urbanus. Uh, our co-worker in Christ, my dear friend Stachus. I imagine some of these are preachers, or at least teachers, maybe even elders, who knows. But what he, how he greets them isn't any different than how he greets the women, is it? And the ones I've highlighted here are women's names. I only know that because I looked it up. <laughs> but, but these are apparently women's names there in verse 12. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, who have worked hard in the Lord. Greet my dear friend Persis, who has worked very hard in the Lord. Those are women. And yet, he's, Paul is calling them out as workers for the Lord. He does not only do that to his fellow preachers, or the elders, or anybody like that. Anybody who's working hard in the Lord, whatever role they have, he, he uh, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, saw that as worthy of recognition. Uh, and then down in, in uh, 13, he, he greets Rufus's mother, and he says, she's my mother too. Yeah, That's, that's the relationship that he had with her. Uh, that was, you know, he had a mother. I don't know if she was still living, but he had this relationship with this other mother too. And, uh, we, we see that promise in the scriptures, don't we? Jesus says, if you leave your father and your mother, you gain a hundred times many, right? You gain fathers and mothers. And it's true. Uh, and, and Paul did as well. And then when you get to verse 15, uh, Philogus and Julia, Nerus and his sister, and, and so on. So we have, we have these greetings, and about half of them, I, I think, are women. Half of them are men. Paul does not indicate that the men are more important in their work in the church than the women are in any way. It's different work, but it's, all of it is critically important for the functioning of the Lord's body. And so we, we need all of it. So what work is there to do? We, we saw that these women were working hard in the Lord, and there were some men who were working hard as well. We're not sure what work they were doing. So besides preaching and teaching and things like that, song leading, what, what can you do? Well, Epaphras was a man, and I think he was a preacher as well, it seems like, but the work that he's called out for doing here is a little bit different. He says in Colossians 4, verse 12, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. He is always wrestling for you in his prayers so that you can stand mature and fully assured in everything God wills. He says the work he's doing for you is prayer. It's prayer work. <laughs> is that he's wrestling for you? I mean, do we think of prayer as wrestling? I don't, I don't usually think of prayer as it's a really difficult thing, although sometimes it's hard, harder than others for us to remember and make time to pray like we should. But he's saying that this is a, something he's devoted to. He's really putting... his words into it, and it's prayer. And that's something every Christian can do. And it's important to recognize how, it, how important prayer is in the work of the church. That we need to be praying for our churches and for the whole church. We need to be praying for one another. It's not 
an empty gesture. For some it is, but for the God's people, it is not an empty gesture. If we are praying in faith, and we're really focused on what the Lord can do, well, He can do it. <laughs> he wants us to be praying. And I'll tell you, that's something a lot of times the women or those that are just disabled or not, not able to get out as much, it's something they do a whole lot better than some of the rest of us do. And it's important work. We, we find this idea, I think, in 1 Timothy 5, when it talks about the widows. In 1 Timothy 5, verse 5, it says, The widow who is truly in need and left all alone has put her hope in God and continues night and day, in her petitions and prayers. Now, it could be that he's talking here about her praying for herself because she, she's really you know, in distress in her, her condition. But I think in the context of what he's talking about here, he's talking about her really devoting her time to prayer for the church and for others. Uh, when, we, when we look at uh, what he talks about down in, in verse 9 and 10, he says, No widow is to be enrolled on the list for support unless she is at least 60 years old, has been the wife of one husband, and is well known for good works. That is, if she has brought up children, shown hospitality, washed the saints' feet, helped the afflicted, and devoted herself to every good work. Well, here you have a list of some of the good works that are necessary in the Lord's body, and he says one of them is bringing up children. Yeah. <laughs> I know a lot, of, a lot of ladies, when they have young children, they, they get kind of depressed that they can't do much teaching, and you know, they, they don't have time for all the studies that they, they did before. But bringing up children is part of the work that God has given, and it's necessary. And if you do that well, your children can turn out to be a blessing more than the teaching that you could have done yourself. And so it, it's, it's wonderful when we are able to, to have women and men, but here he's focused on the women, bringing up children. Showing hospitality. Hospitality is, is uh, something that can be difficult for some. Some are, met, are better at it than others. And, and some just do it differently than others. But when you're able to bring in people that you don't even know into your home, that's pretty great. When we came in to Atlanta, uh, we flew in, we were tired. Uh, it's, a, it's a long trip from South Africa. And there were some Christians there in Atlanta that we'd never met. They didn't know us, but they knew some people that knew us. And they said, you can come spend the night at our house. They had a very comfortable place. And, and they, they went to Bible study, and we left the door unlocked. And we just went in. <laughs> Uh, and, and so my parents and, and my family were able to spend the night there and then come to Alabama the next day. That's hospitality. That's showing this, this kind of care for strangers. Yes, we're brethren, but we're still strangers. And that's, that's wonderful. That's something God wants the church to be doing. And some people can do that better than others can, and they're doing a great work when they do that. And washing the saints' feet, some of you have done that, I'm sure, with your parents, <laughs> uh, not, and with your children. But, but they're not, children usually aren't saints when you're washing their feet. But, uh, but yeah, when you take care of your parents, that, that would be part of it, uh, especially your godly parents. But... It's more than just that. It's taking care of whatever physical needs your brethren have. Isn't that the idea here? Washing in the feet. Uh, I think I've probably told, told you all this before at one point, but I, I've had my foot, one foot washed by somebody before. 
in Nigeria when I stepped in sewage <laughs> with sandals on. And uh, Sister Blessing, uh, the, the wife of the preacher, grabbed a water bottle and washed my foot off. Now, I could have done that myself, I think, but she was just quick to do it. <laughs> and that, But that's the idea. When you see a need, you take care of it. And there's a lot of sisters that are good at that. There's some men that are really good at that, too. And even if those men aren't able to serve publicly as well, perhaps, as some of the other men, when they're doing this kind of work, it's great. It's wonderful. It needs to be done. And helping the afflicted. When you're, when you're able to see people in trouble and you reach out to them and you take care of them, he says, that's, that's the kind of widows that deserve to be supported by the church, people that have done this in their life, because they've been devoted to all these good works that Christ wants us to be doing. All of these things are important, and some do it better than others, different things, and we all need to be busy with what we're able to do. I want to get down to verse 12, 11 and 12. He says, but refuse to enroll younger widows, for when they are drawn away from Christ by desire, they want to marry and will therefore receive condemnation because they have renounced their original pledge. Now, uh, this isn't a terribly clear passage, but I believe what he's talking about here is these widows to be put on the roll are being supported not because... They are needy Christians. They're being supported because they're working for the church. And they've made a commitment to do that. It's not wrong for the younger widows to marry. In fact, he tells them later, I want them to get married <laughs> and, and raise children and do all these things that the older widows have already done. But he says, what, what I want these older widows doing is praying night and day. It's, that seems to be, from the way I read it, what he's talking about. That's a work that they're doing for the church, and they're worthy to be considered for that work because of all the other good work they've already done in their lives. You can disagree with me about the specifics on that passage because it's not terribly clear, but I've never seen that done, never seen widows put on the roll to be supported to do that work but seems like it would be a pretty valuable service for the church to have someone devoted to prayer like that. And, you know, those that can't speak in the church, they're, they're just necessary for the functioning of the church. Uh, I don't know if you can read what I put underneath there, but in the Lord's body, there's no such thing as a vestigial organ. <laughs> We, we are all necessary. The things that we're able to do are necessary. In 1 Corinthians 12, in verse 14 through 30, he says, Indeed, the body is not one part, but many. If the foot should say, Because I'm not a hand, I don't belong in the body, it is not for that reason any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, Because I'm not an eye, I don't belong in the body, it is not for that reason any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God has arranged each one of the parts in the body just as he wanted. And we'll pause there and just say, you know, it. He, he's making the point here that there are people in the church, in the body of Christ, who don't feel like they're worth much because they're not, able to do something that somebody else does. He says, you know, they may feel that way, but they're not any less a part of the body. They're necessary for the functioning of the body. God has designed things the way he wants it. So if you're not able to do something, that's according to God's design. You have things you can do. That's okay. <laughs> it's good. Verse 19, and if they are all the same part, if they were all the same part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, 
Or again, the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that are weaker are indispensable. And those parts of the body that we consider less honorable, we clothe these with greater honor. And our unrespectable parts are treated with greater respect, which our respectable parts do not need. Instead, God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the less honorable, so that there would be no division in the body, but that the members would have the same concern for each other. He says, look, if you think you don't need your brethren because you can do these things and they can't, well, you're, you're not thinking straight. We all need each other. If everybody was one thing, there would be no body. The point of the body is we're different. We have different roles, and all of it is necessary. And he says, even though we have parts of our body we consider less respectable, we actually end up showing them more honor because we clothe them. <laughs> we, we decorate them, right? We we actually honor them more. And when we have those in the church that maybe they don't get up here in front of everybody, they're not recognized, what should we be doing? Clothing them with more honor, right? Making sure they understand that the work they're doing is important. That's something we need to be doing. Verse 26, if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individual members of it. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, next miracles and gifts of healing, helping, leading, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all do miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now, for most of these things, we'd have to say, well, none of us. <laughs> none of us do any of this today. We're not, none of us are prophets. You know, Adam told me his wife had a dream last night that I didn't show up, and he had to come up with a sermon. Well, she's clearly not a prophet. So. But we're, we're, not, we're not apostles. We have teachers, thankfully. But that's about the only thing on the list, isn't it? <laughs> we, but we can't say, well, because we don't do any of those things, we're not worth anything. No. But his point is, everybody pretty much can say, there's something that I can't do, that others can do. Even the apostles. Remember Acts chapter 6? They, they said, we, this is super important to take care of the widows. We have other work that we have to do. Appoint men to do that work. They couldn't do it and do what they were supposed to be doing uh, that Christ gave them to do. We all have work to do. In Romans 12, in verse 3 through 13, he says, For by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Instead, think sensibly, as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. Now, as we have many parts in one body, and all the parts do not have the same function, in the same way, we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. According to the grace given to us, we have different gifts. If prophecy, use it according to the proportion of one's faith. If service, use it in service. If teaching, in teaching. If exhorting, in exhortation, giving with generosity leading with, with diligence, showing mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy, detest evil, cling to what is good. So if we pause here. He says, look, you, you don't need to think high, more highly of yourself than you ought. Just because you can do something somebody else can't doesn't make you more important to God. Uh, that's, that's not how God thinks. So lower yourself. <laughs> and and uh, uh, understand that we're all on the same level in the eyes of God. Uh, but we have different works to do. 
And some can do that more than others. Some are good at serving. Some are good at giving. Some are, are good at, at leading. Some are good with mercy. But whatever it is that you're good at, do it with the, to the best of your ability to help the whole body. It's not about us. It's about Christ and his body. Verse 10, let love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. Take the lead in honoring one another. Do not lack diligence and zeal. Be fervent in the spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in affliction. Be persistent in prayer. Share with the saints and their needs. Pursue hospitality. Yeah. Not, not a lot there specifically about preaching or teaching or song leading or things like that, is there? But there's a lot to be done. The whole body is supposed to be active and working. And we need to be honoring one another in that work. Uh, I think brethren here, at least in the past, I assume it's still true, have done a good job with that. You know, when, when there's a work day and brethren show up, you know, there's a lot of encouragement, there's thanks, there's a appreciation of what, what the men are doing, what the women are doing. There's, there's recognition of that. But a lot of times the work that we do isn't public, and so it's not really seen, is it? So if you know of work that your, your brethren are doing that others don't know about, Show them honor. Tell them, this is important, what you're doing. It's great. We need this. So the church needs the evangelists. It needs the elders. It needs the teachers. God gave those to the church, and it's necessary. But the church also needs those who show hospitality, and that's just as necessary. Needs those who take care of the needs of the saints, those who raise children, those who can do physical or technical work for the, the, the church. All those things are equally necessary. Every part of the body is necessary for the functioning of the body. And you don't need to recognize one more than the other. Um, it may be that somebody does more work than others, and you can recognize that. <laughs> But we need to recognize the work everybody's doing. And not just, you know, there, there's, a, there's just a problem sometimes, which I as a preacher notice, that preachers get a lot of attention. Uh, whereas those that are working just as hard in other ways don't. And uh, we need everybody to know. You know what I you know what I forgot, Brother Adam? I forgot about there's an invitation. <laughs> it's the first time first first place I've spoken uh, in America on this trip, so I'm out of that habit. We don't give invitations in South Africa in most places anyway that I've worked with. So I'm out I'm out of the practice. But I let me just say this. Uh, before we get up and we sing. If you're not part of the body, you're missing out. And you know, if you haven't obeyed the gospel of Christ, you're not part of his body. You get into Christ through baptism. That's what Galatians 3 tells us. And it's baptism because of faith. We're all children of God through faith in Christ. For all those who have been baptized into Christ, to put on Christ. We, we're, we don't need to, to say, well, you know, I like coming to church, but I don't want to be part of Christ. What, what would be the point of that? The church is all about Christ, isn't it? The, the only reason not to obey the gospel is when you don't understand the gospel. 
If you understand what you're being saved from and being saved for, the good works God has planned for you, then you should be jumping to, to obey the gospel. If you have not obeyed the gospel, maybe it's because you don't understand it. And if you don't understand it, I'll be happy to talk with you about it. And I know there's a lot of men and women here who are very capable of explaining the gospel to you. But if you want to obey the gospel, if you've been thinking about it, and you want to become part of Christ, be saved from your sins, saved for the work that, that Christ has given us to do, this is a great time to do it. You can do it anytime. It doesn't have to be when we're all together. But you don't want to wait 